Good morning. Welcome to all of you who did not go away on this long weekend. It's good to see you here. If you're visiting, we're glad that you've joined us today. So we've gathered to worship our God on this unofficial last weekend of the summer. Some of the kids already went back to school. Others will start after the weekend. And it's a notable shift in our rhythm of life when school begins again. And but we're here today, start of a new week on a Sunday to gather before God to bring our praises to His name, to worship Him, the one and only God who alone deserves all our worship and praise. And our call to worship comes from Psalm 135, which indeed does that. It calls us to praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, you servants of the Lord, you who minister in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for that is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob to be his own Israel, to be his treasured, treasured possession. I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is greater than all gods. The Lord does whatever pleases him, in the heavens and on the earth, <clears throat> in the seas and all their depths. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from the storehouses. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, through all generations, for the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. <clears throat> Psalm goes on to talk about idols made of silver and gold, and that'll be our <clears throat> focus today, not necessarily idols, but talking about wealth as we continue looking at the Sermon on the Mount. But before we get there, let's open our service singing praise to God. Our first song will be, O Praise God's Name Together new rendition of the words from Psalm 135, but with a familiar tune, one of the most beautiful tunes, I think, in all of Christian hymnody. So let's stand together when the music plays and sing our opening song together.
People of God, our help is in the name of the Lord, the one who's created the heavens and the earth. Receive a greeting from him. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. We've been discussing the Lord's Prayer. We've been talking about how it is good, it is right for us to come before God's throne, even though we are unworthy to do so. Our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, encourages us to pray, and God expects us to pray as his children. We hear these words from James calling us into a time of prayer. Is, there, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. The miracle, the wonder of prayer, we pray for things, we pray for healing. God doesn't always grant what we ask for but he always gives us what we need. And so we come before God as his children, dependent on him, trusting in him that God answers our prayers in his time according to his will, according to what we need, 
what he knows we need. So let's come before God in prayer, bring the petitions that are on our hearts before him in silence, and he knows that what we need and he will answer our prayers. And so let's bow our heads and come before God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we thank you that we could sing praises to your name again as we gather here in worship this time that we take out of our busy lives to rest in you and your goodness, to reflect on your faithfulness, your love. We gather in your grace and in your mercy because we are broken sinners who don't deserve to come before your throne, the throne of the only true and righteous God of creation. And yet you invite us to come before you as your children. You come before us because you love us. And so we obediently will do that now, and we do that throughout our week, Lord. We come before your throne because our lives depend on you. You have numbered our days. You know exactly how long each of us will spend on this earth. We need to remember, Lord, that our days are numbered. We need to remember that you put us on this earth to live for you. And so help us, Lord, to do that. Sometimes it's hard to live for you. The temptations of this world, the sights and sounds, they lure us away from you. We confess that, that we are sinners, that we give in to temptation, that our focus is too earthly. Yes, we need to focus on what we need to do here in our lives day to day, but we often resort to living as though this life is all we have. We try to make it our best life now, and that would be wrong to do because that takes away that eternal focus that you want each of your children to have because in Christ, through faith in him, we have eternity in the new creation before us. So always give us a right and true perspective on who we are in Christ and who we are as your children. Sometimes, Lord, ill health draws our attention away from your goodness and your faithfulness. We wonder, why am I sick? Or why is my loved one not getting better? We need to rest in you. And we ask, Lord, that for those who are going through a difficult time of illness, of ill health, Lord, a failing body, that you would be near them in a special way. I think of Wanda. Today is her birthday, Lord. And she finds herself in the care beds in McLeod, and from our perspective, Lord, she is weakening, and we don't know how long you will keep her here, but it looks like she is coming closer to the end, the near end of her life, Lord, and she is ready for that. We thank you for her testament of faith in the Lord Jesus. We pray that you be near her, Gary, as they go through this difficult time, as they walk through this valley shadow of death. Be near them, we pray. We think of others. We're dealing with illnesses, diseases. We think of James and Bernice as they've had a difficult period of dealing with health concerns. We ask that you be near them. We pray, Lord, that you would remind them of your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, we think of others who've had surgeries to deal with cancer or other people who are having other treatments, Lord, to deal with diseases. And <clears throat> we pray that those treatments may be effective. We think of Mike, Riznik, and others, Lord. Be near them in a special way as they may be tempted to lose hope. Let them find that their eternal hope rests in you, Lord God, and in Jesus Christ and in faith in him. We thank you, Lord, when prognosis turns well and Turns out well, and we thank you for Audrey that she was given a good report that the cancer did not spread, that they were able to catch it in time. Thank you for that, Lord. We ask that you continue to be near her and Bruno as she recovers and deals with the after effects of that surgery, to remove the cancer. Be near her, Lord, and be with others as they deal with aging bodies, and joints that don't work like they used to the aches and pains that seem to be there more often than not. As our bodies show us that they break down, Lord, we know we are fragile, but we rest in you. We thank you, Lord, for new life. We rejoice with 
Fred and Deb and Joe as a grandson was born to them. We rejoice with Jeremy and Carly that Asher, Ian, John, Lozeman has been brought into this world, and we pray, Lord, that we thank you for a, a good birth, Caesarean. We pray for recovery for Carly, and we ask, Lord, that you be near this young family. Be with all our families, Lord, especially our youngest families with newborns and, and children who are in elementary school that age, Lord. There's so much that they learn, but they also pick up so much that is wrong in this world. And we pray for the parents of young children that you would make them diligent and, and watchful because of the ways of this world that are under Satan's control infect even our youngest children. So we pray for our children and youth, Lord, that you be near them. <clears throat> Guide them as they've some have started school. And others will start next week. We ask that you protect them as they learn, that they would learn what is true and what is false, that they would cling to what is true, that they would turn to you, Lord Jesus, at their age and look to you as their Savior. And we pray, Lord, for <clears throat> women who are pregnant in our midst, in our congregation, in our family. We ask, Lord, that those pregnancies will progress well and without incident, that you would bring forth um, new children into this world, that in due time we can rejoice with these couples in the birth of their children. Lord, we pray for your protection as the harvest continues. We thank you, Lord, for <clears throat> rain that fell this past week, a good amount of rain that will help some crops like hay, but reduce the fire risk, Lord, and we thank you for that. <clears throat> for others, it was perhaps rain not needed, but we look to you, Lord, and you give us, as we just sang, you give us what we need, the clouds and the rain, and you determine that it's good to do so. We pray, Lord, that as the season continues, you will protect us on the roads and in the fields. Watch over us, we pray. We ask, Lord, that in all that we do, we would live for your honor and for your glory, whatever stage we are at in life, that we would live in obedience to you seek to, as we'll hear shortly, build treasures in heaven and not cling so tightly to the things of this earth, including our very lives. And so, Lord, we look to your providential care, your hand of blessing as we go forth in the week that lies ahead. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's confess our Christian faith through the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, Q&A 27. I'll read the question. Together we can read the answer. What do you understand by the providence of God? The almighty and ever-present power of God, by which God upholds, as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. <clears throat> and that'll be the theme, God's providence, this week and next week as we <clears throat> journey through uh, the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> Let's stand together and sing, Nearer, Still Nearer, a song, that, a song of confession, a song of assurance that God is with us and we journey with him. Let's stand together and sing.
please turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, we're going to read verses 19 through 24. Bow our heads once more and ask for the Lord's blessing before we read. Gracious God, we turn to your word, words that are ancient yet true, words that will forever be true for your people. You call us to follow your words and we turn to the words of Jesus Christ. He speaks about a topic that affects each and every one of us every day of our lives because we live here on this earth. It's a topic we perhaps don't want to think about, but our Lord makes us think about it because we are studying His Word to us. So Lord, as we study Christ's words and we consider Your message to us, may our hearts be open to receive that message and let it work in us, Holy Spirit, so that we'd, we would be transformed, so that we would be the kingdom citizens that Jesus Christ, our King, desires and demands of us. So hear our prayers. We pray that in his name. Amen. Matthew 6, beginning at verse 19. <clears throat> Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of the Lord. So we spent the last several weeks looking at the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus stopped in the flow of his sermon to offer that model prayer to his disciples, and we noted how the prayer is about God's glory and our needs. Today's passage returns us to the Lord's teaching on how kingdom people ought to live. Christ our King expects his subjects to live kingdom lives. And that involves living for Jesus Christ, who is God our King. As we get back into the Sermon on the Mount, we should review, just give an overview of what the Lord has been teaching. The sermon starts with what we call the Beatitudes, the blessed are sayings, describe the heart attitudes that kingdom people must have. And to live out these Beatitudes, believers in Jesus Christ, they must have their hearts set on Jesus Christ. Then Jesus tells his followers that they are, he says, you are salt and light, and being salt and light speaks to our purpose. Why did God save people and make them his kingdom community? For one, to be a preserving influence on a decaying humanity, and also to bring the light of Jesus Christ to a world that is lost in darkness, the darkness of sin and evil. To be salt and light to a dying and lost world means having a heart that cares for others. We care for others by bringing Jesus Christ to the world. That too is a matter of the heart. To care is to love. To share Jesus Christ is to love from the heart. Jesus then speaks of God's law. He says he fulfills all of God's law. And he did that by being perfectly obedient, by paying for sin. Jesus fulfilled God's law in full by being the fulfillment of God's redemption plan. And as his followers, we are to live into Jesus Christ, the great law fulfiller. Now, we can't keep the law perfectly, but Jesus has done that for us. And we, in turn, then, must seek to follow him and follow his example. Keeping God's law by following Jesus Christ, that too is a matter of the heart. 
But outward law-keeping, it means nothing if our heart is not in it. If the heart does not have God's glory as the goal, then our actions are meaningless at worst, at best, I should say. And at worst, our lives are then self-glorifying if our hearts are not set on God and His glory. If our hearts do not belong to Jesus Christ, our King, we will live for ourselves. And if our hearts do not focus on Christ, we will end up serving the kingdom of darkness. In chapter 6, Jesus speaks of the spiritual disciplines, giving, praying, fasting. And we saw we, when we looked at those words, those passages, that those spiritual disciplines are to be done for God's glory as well. We are not to act spiritually for the praise of people. We act spiritually in private and in secret to grow closer to God. By growing closer to God, we will be the kingdom citizens He demands that we be. And only by growing closer to God can we be perfect like our Father in heaven is perfect, as Jesus commands. So what does it mean to be perfect like God? What does it look like for a human being to be God-like? Well, God gave us an example. The example is Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. To be like God and perfect like Him means to live like Jesus. And that requires, again, having the heart of Jesus. And Jesus' heart was set fully upon glorifying God the Father. Our Lord's heart was set on serving God in His role as Mass, uh, Messiah and Savior. That brings us now to the next portion, the next section in our Lord's Sermon. Today's passage is all about what or who our hearts belong to. What have we set our hearts' desires upon? Earthly things? or heavenly things. And by heavenly things, that means God Himself. We are to set our hearts on God and His purposes, His will, not on earthly things. And at this point, Jesus moves from talking about our inner spirituality to our outer public behavior. The why we do what we do and the why we live like we live here on earth. What's our motivation? What drives us? What occupies our waking hours? What are our hearts chasing after? And Jesus hits the number one area that every human being must deal with, something that easily attracts our hearts, and that's our material goods and wealth and money and all that goes along with that. And while at first glance these things may seem secular and divorced from, spirit, from our spiritual lives, they are not. What we do Monday to Saturday is not separated from our spiritual life. Our drives and our endeavors in this physical world, they are outcomes of our spiritual state of being. Everything about our lives is religious because we live before the face of God. And God knows that our hearts, He knows our hearts, He sees all that we do. He knows what our hearts desire more clearly than even we do. So how close we are to God, that will show up in our attitudes towards material goods and wealth and money. Now this shift from spiritual disciplines in verses 1 through 18 to physical worldly life in verses 19 through 34, it seems very abrupt. But Jesus sees both areas as critically important for his followers and for kingdom citizens as his followers are called to be. Jesus knows how enticing, how consuming the material world is. He knows that sinful human desires to crave stuff and to crave the tool that gets us more stuff, which is money. Jesus knows worldly ambition and materialism, that these are huge temptations for each and every one of us. He exposes these temptations all throughout his ministry. Jesus talks about money and things related to money more than any other topic. So money and wealth, they are not neutral. Economics is not neutral. All the systems that structure our human society and life they are subject to satanic manipulation. And because Satan corrupts all systems, and especially the financial systems that we are part of, that we use, we're all at risk. Material goods, wealth, money, these things have the power to enslave our hearts. They easily become idols that we worship. And any idol that we worship, knowingly or unknowingly, it replaces God in our lives. 
So again, what Jesus is getting at here is, what are our hearts desiring? In what are we putting our faith, our trust, our hope? Jesus knows that we are easily entrapped by materialism. Knowing this about us, and knowing this about the human life, Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. And then he follows that up, that warning up with a reason. He says, for worldly, earthly treasures, they are easily destroyed. They're easily taken from us. Earthly things, especially our treasures, they are transient, they are fleeting. We can spend a lifetime gathering and accumulating stuff only to lose it all. We can spend our days chasing dollars and wealth. And in the end, we have nothing to show for it. Why is that? Because the hard reality of life is that we will all die if our Lord does not return. And when we die, we take nothing with us. We leave every earthly treasure behind. Jesus talks about thieves coming in to steal what we gather and accumulate. Well, the ultimate thief is death. Death takes away our stuff, but it also takes away our earthly vessel, our body. Jesus offers the antidote to materialism, to chasing after earthly treasures. He says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Treasures in heaven, they are safe and secure and incorruptible. Treasures in heaven are the eternal rewards that our King will give us one day. Jesus calls his followers to have a heavenly, eternal perspective as they journey through life here on this physical earth. As he says in verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Heavenly treasures are kept in the place where God resides. Heaven is all about God. And so our hearts, as Jesus has taught repeatedly, they must be set upon the Lord God. To store up treasures in heaven is to live life dealing in a different kind of currency. Storing up treasures in heaven is about making transactions in God's currency, and God's currency is love. And that's why Jesus, uh, later in his ministry, sums up the whole law as saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Instead of focusing on building earthly bank accounts, amassing wealth, we are to focus on spiritual, heavenly bank accounts, as it were. And those heavenly accounts hold and disperse and multiply love, God's love. To fill our heavenly accounts with love, we use the material stuff around us, to be sure. And in this passage, Jesus is not advocating that all Christians must live in poverty, He's not saying that owning things is bad. He's not saying being wealthy is a sin. He's also not advocating that Christians give everything away and go live like a hermit. What he's getting at is this. Do we control and master our material wealth, or does our material wealth control and master us? Do we use our earthly lives and all the stuff that's at our disposal for our gain and glory? Or are we using our lives and abilities to create wealth ultimately for God and for His glory? In verse 24, Jesus states it point blank. There's zero room for uncertainty here. He says we can't serve two masters. We often try. He says either we will hate one and love the other, or we will be devoted to one and despise the other. Life is all about what we love and what our hearts desire. Do we believe Jesus when he says we cannot serve both God and money? He tells us the truth, but we need to believe him. So who is our master? God in Christ Jesus or the material goods and wealth that the world chases after? Who is our master, our Lord? We all serve something or someone. And Jesus Christ, if our faith is him is in him, is calling us as his followers to check our hearts and to answer that question, as hard as that may be. Who or what has your heart? Well, make it personal. Who or what has my heart? Jesus wants our hearts. He 
fact, Jesus demands our hearts as his people. Thankfully, the Bible helps us to know and to understand how to build treasures in heaven. God has preserved the stories and the accounts of the early church to guide us. One example it comes from the churches in Philippi, Macedonia. In 2 Corinthians 8, Paul talks about the churches there. It's a fairly lengthy quote, uh, passage, but listen to what he says. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. The Macedonian Christians were poor, and yet their desire was to help in the mission. What mission was that? That was the gospel of salvation and Jesus Christ's mission, spreading the good news of Jesus. And so these poor Christians, they collected what money they could, and they gave to the mission. They spent earthly money to spread the spiritual currency of God's love. This example shows us how the earthly aspects of life, like money and wealth, wealth cannot be divorced from the spiritual aspect of our living. In 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, Paul again makes this connection, this connection between the kingdom of God living and living here in a material world. Again, this is a longer passage, but hear how he connects wealth, earthly wealth, with the gospel and with treasures that are eternal. He says, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation, using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, earthly wealth, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. The mission of Christians, all Christians, is to build on the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ's foundation. And we do that by using our earthly material goods and wealth that God gives us to build on that spiritual foundation, the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus. And we are to build with the proper heart intentions, the proper motivations. Paul warns the Corinthians, God will test our work. He will reveal the condition of our hearts. And if our heart motivations are God-glorifying and Christ-centered, then the work that we do, those treasures, they will be heavenly treasures, and they will hold and they will remain. But if our heart motivations are selfish and self-glorifying, then those treasures will be destroyed because they they are earthly treasures. Anything we do not out of love for God and neighbor, that is worthless deeds that God rejects. So we are to use our material goods and our very lives for spiritual ends, for spiritual goals. That's how we build and store treasures in heaven. Jesus also demonstrates this in the parable of the sheep and goats. The parable parable shows how the currency of Christians is to be God's love. In that parable, Jesus warns that on judgment day, the king will come and he will assess every person's life. He will separate the sheep from the goats. To the sheep on his right, he will say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the treasures stored in heaven, which include the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Whatever you did for the least of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. By caring for others, 
Christians spend the currency of God's love, and in doing so, they store treasures in heaven. To the goats, Jesus has a stern warning and judgment and rejection. The goats are those who did not trade and transact in God's currency of love. They use their wealth, their money on themselves, and only for their enjoyment, for their glory. They built no heavenly treasure. Their hearts were not set on God and not living on like and loving like Jesus. Their hearts were hard to all but people but themselves. The fruit of their labors went to themselves. In verses 22 and 23, we find Jesus talking about eyes being good or bad. That has to do with spiritual vision. Spiritual wellness is affected by what our hearts desire. A desire for earthly treasure by which we pamper ourselves, it dulls our spiritual vision. When earthly goods block our hearts from seeking God and His ways, we go blind spiritually. And that spiritual blindness might ultimately lead to death. Money, wealth, those things are not evil. The Bible tells us that. But as Paul tells Timothy, it's the love of money that is a root of all kinds of evil. We can't love wealth and love God at the same time, Jesus teaches. If we serve money, it's our Lord, it's our Master. It will lead us towards sin and evil through self-love. We turn to Paul once more as he instructs Timothy on how to lead Christians concerning their wealth. Again, it's a lengthy passage, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. But it illustrates well what Jesus is teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount about proper treasure building. Paul writes, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them, that is the rich, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Good deeds, a willingness to share, those are acts of love. And these love actions, they convert earthly wealth into spiritual treasure. That exchange rate, that investment growth, it produces eternal treasure that is beyond our belief. It will be beyond our wildest dreams. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what makes us citizens of God's kingdom. And growing faith in Jesus, that draws our hearts more and more to Him. And as we're drawn more to Jesus, we will live like Him more and more. What is it to live like Jesus? It is to love. We love God by producing fruits of obedience to His will. We love others by bringing the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ to them. We love others by being the hands and feet of Christ to those God brings into our path who are in need. That's how we store up treasure in heaven. Just to be clear, Jesus is not teaching salvation by works here. He's not saying that what we do saves us. But as is taught, taught elsewhere, what we do shows that we are saved. Our faith must bear good fruit. Our faith must show itself to be true faith by our deeds and acts of love and service. We have our Lord's promise that he will return. He will reward all those who carry out lives and deeds and acts of love. That's heavenly treasure building. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you give us instructions here, commands that we confess are hard to follow. <clears throat> I think for all of us, we're guilty of building treasures here on earth. You've given us the means to produce and accumulate, and we live in a very wealthy part of the world. Our affluence, Lord, can dull our vision. Our wealth can prevent us from seeing you, your mission, those in need. We ask, Lord, that you help us to put things in proper perspective 
to put our wealth where it belongs. It is not first place. You, Lord, deserve first place. Jesus, you call us to love God above all things. You call us to love our neighbors as ourselves. You've given us the means to do that through our earthly treasures, through our earthly wealth. And as your word clearly shows us and teaches us, we are to use that wealth to spread the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ around the world. And in so doing, we build earth, uh, heavenly treasures that will not fade or rust or be stolen. We are building an inheritance and a reward that you will give us when we go to be with you and when we live with you in the new creation. And so, Lord, give us a right perspective, not to hold on so tightly to earthly wealth, but to use that and convert it into spiritual currency, spiritual treasure. And, Lord, make us willing, generous, wanting to share so that we can spread the kingdom of God and the love of Jesus Christ around us and show that we belong to a different kingdom, that we follow different systems than the corrupt systems of this world. And in so doing, show that we belong to Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Master, because He is our Savior and our King. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen. Song of response, cast down, O God, the idols, and we'll stand together when the music plays and sing. <clears throat> Be seated.
In a moment, the deacons will come around and collect an offering for Calvin University. For those who don't know, Calvin University is the Christian Reformed Church's um, owned and sanctioned university. So that's what the money will go towards. If you're a guest, you're welcome to give to that ministry, that work there. And while the offering is being collected, we'll remain seated and we'll sing, Oh, for a closer walk with thee. Dear Lord, you have you are so thank we are so thankful and for the many blessings you have given us. We are also grateful that you have provided schools like Calvin University to prepare men and women for ministry and leadership positions in the church and in the world. Bless these funds as they were used to support those who wish to have a community faith, a center of learning and and a life of ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> You're all invited to the hall afterwards for a time of fellowship. Before we go into this day and the week that lies ahead, we go with the Lord's blessing. So receive a parting benediction from our God. Peace be to the brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, and love with faith from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus. May God's grace be to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. Closing song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, 559 in the gray, if you want to follow it with music. Mm -hmm.